Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for what you yourself are doing in our midst. Uh, Lord, I think everybody in this building is probably done with hype and with man's gimmicks and with man's anything. Lord, we really just want you. And we really want what is pure. And we really want what is true. And God, we ask you for that this morning. Father, grace us, Lord, to have ears to hear and hearts to understand. And that, Father, your word would penetrate into our hearts this morning and change our lives for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. How are you guys? Uh, that, was, that was pretty stout this morning. And there's a whole lot more where that came from. Most of you guys know, I'm just going to jump right into this. Um, Most of you guys know what's happening. Everybody that's alive probably knows about what's happening in Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. How many of you guys have watched some of the videos from from that? Have you seen some of the the goings-on? I told you last Sunday spontaneously from the pulpit, I said, I I think I'm just going to have to get in the car and go. Well, we did. Um, I made the offer for more people, but only David Lowe showed up. So you know what? Me and David got in a rental car, and we went. And we had quite the adventure, let me tell you. But we did go down Thursday, and we're able to get in the building, I think, about 5 o'clock. And we stayed until about 10. So we spent about five hours in that atmosphere. So here's something pretty interesting from Wednesday to Wednesday, it went 24 hours of day, like pretty much nonstop worship. Kind of like a David's, David's Tabernacle type deal. What do you think that atmosphere was like when we stepped in there a week after they'd been worshiping God for 24 hours straight? Let me tell you, you didn't have to ask if God was close or if he was near or if he was in the room. When I walked in the door, and David, I think, had the same thing, my legs felt like jello. I physically felt weak, and I was like, please don't let me fall down right here in the entrance so people had to step over me. (laughs) And there was, I think that place seats 1,700, and of course, every seat is filled, and it's kind of like a constant movement. You come in this one door, and then people go out this door. So people, somebody might come in there and stay an hour. Somebody might come in there and stay 10 hours. But there's always people coming out and going in, right, on like a circle. So we got in there, and uh, it kind of worked to our advantage. They had just had five hours of thunderstorms and hard rain. So when we got there, the line was pretty short, (laughs) which it hasn't been. You know, I mean, uh, you guys know J.T. Wiggins. He was there yesterday and stood in line for seven hours to get in the building. And it was, what, 40 degrees outside? And him and his kids stood out in 40 degrees for seven hours just to get in the building. David and I got lucky. We only had to stand out there, what, 15, 20 minutes before we were able to get in? So we just kind of accidentally timed it just right. The thunderstorm cleared everybody out, and then we could get in. But we did get our car stuck. That's another story for another time. Yeah, it was a mud bog. We got, we got pulled out by a tow truck when we left the revival. True story. David messed up his shoes. There's all kind of fun stories. But um, I want to tell you that, that when I walked in that building, my first thought was, oh, my goodness, this is the real deal. And I'm going to go on record here, and I know that nobody in this room fits this category and probably nobody watching our live stream. But to the revival critics, can I just tell you, please, shut up. Amen. Just shut up. Amen. I am so... Oh, I think it did. Oh, just shut up. It's God. Can we quit fighting? It's God. We'll figure out the details later. It's God. Uh, But what I saw when I walked in that building was probably the purest, simplest worship. There was no fancy nothing. I mean, you're in a hundred year old building it's like a time capsule you feel like you step back in time this big old building 
they literally had an acoustic piano, an acoustic guitar that was out of tune, and a box drum that didn't sound as good as the one I have. It's this little tiny little thing. And I'm telling you, these kids were worshiping like you've never seen. And it was just pure, and it was just so... And, and when they... And, of course, there was no screens, there was nothing. When they would just take off the first line of the song, 1,700 people would just start singing. And I guess they were singing songs that somehow people ended up knowing them, but it was like everybody was just in there to worship God. Could it really be that simple? Could it be that simple that just people wanted to worship Jesus and they couldn't stop? Because that's what happened. They started and they couldn't stop. Do you know, I think that's probably going to happen one day. We're going to start and we're not going to be able to stop. Don't get quiet on me now. They didn't plan a revival. They started and they couldn't stop. That's all that happened. They started worshiping the king, and they became so overwhelmed by him that they could not stop worshiping the king. And when I was sitting up there in that balcony, I had a really strong sense, because probably 80% of the people in the room were under 25 years old. Not to say that the rest of us can't still experience God, because I did, trust me, I'll tell you about that in a minute. But here's what I knew was happening. God was revealing himself to a new generation. Did you hear what I just said? Everybody talks about this woke generation and this Gen Z and all these kids. They don't even know if they're a guy or a girl or a cat. They're so confused. I'm serious. And God is revealing himself to them. He does it in every generation. I'm not saying that the older generation is not going to be affected by it because we are, but I'm telling you, God is showing himself to people that did not yet know him. There's a bunch of us in this room that have experienced God a lot. But what I had a sense of is that a lot of these kids were experiencing him for the very first time. And you know what their response was? They were giving him everything. They were laying their lives down because they finally met him. I'm not saying they didn't grow up in church. I'm not saying they didn't have Christian parents. I'm saying they met God in a very tangible face-to-face way and they laid their lives down. I was sitting there watching it. I, I mean, I was worshiping the Lord, but half the time I was just watching all these kids. I'm like, man, that is real. I'm watching this little girl in about the fifth row just weeping, cannot stop weeping. She's shaking. She's weeping so hard. And this is breaking out all over the room. They're just having their own encounter with God for the very first time. You want to talk about something beautiful to watch? I literally was watching kids fall in love with Jesus. And I walked out of there with one thought. This whole thing is about first love. The whole thing. Now, have there been signs and wonders and miracles? Sure there have. They, a couple kids got up and gave some testimonies. Hey, I prayed for somebody and they had a, you know, a cast on and they had a broke ankle and the next day they came back and their cast was off and they were healed. I mean, we had stories like that. But it did not have the center of attention at all. What had the center of attention is that these kids were falling madly in love with Jesus. How did we make it so complicated? Come on, I'm talking to those of us that are older and have been around for a little bit. How did we make it so complicated when it just really is about falling in love with Jesus? Ah. So, I will say this too. You know me. I always have the same perspective when I get to go around things like this because remarkably, I have... This is the third thing that I've been able to physically, literally partake of. The Brownsville Revival, the Toronto Outpouring, and now Asbury. So three things in my lifetime at 45. I can't even believe I've been able to experience three massive moves of God. But I always have the same perspective, and it's this. Oh God, make me a sponge. And whatever essence of what you're doing, would you just allow me to soak this up 
into my being (laughs) and go back where I'm from. Because God's not calling me to move to Wilmore, Kentucky. Thank God for what he's doing there. But I will say this. We were up in the balcony. They leave the floor open for the for the younger kids, right? And then up in the balcony, it's kind of overflow, so guys like me and David get to go up to the balcony, which is fine. It was I was about to fall down on the balcony. The presence of God was everywhere. But I tapped the usher on the shoulder, and I said, I said, would it be possible for me to get down there to that altar? And this was beautiful, man. All of these people that were the ushers, I didn't find this out till later, they were like the Ph.D. professors at the college, all the ushers. Yeah. And nobody knows, so they're incognito, and these are like the guys that are running the school and, and the teachers and everything. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take you down. So we went down the little stairs, and I went down to the altar. And this is just this old, wooden, 100-year-old, old-fashioned altar. And you know that Asbury has had multiple revivals like this. This is, this is not the first time this has happened. The last one was in 1970 that was really huge, so 53 years ago. But they've had multiple things like this. So I put my face down on that altar, got on my knees and put my face in that altar and laid my hands out. And I said, God, whatever essence of what you're doing here, I just want to be a sponge. I just want to soak this up. And obviously I did. I laid there for, I don't know, how how long were we down on that altar? Like maybe 30 minutes or? You you don't really have time. In those moments, you really don't know if you've been there two minutes or an hour. But I laid with my face on that altar and just, man, wave after wave of just, just God. And this is something really intriguing. David, I don't even know if, to, if I told you this part. When I first went down the altar, I put my hands down on the altar and I felt something in my hand, which was really odd. And I looked up, and I, I pulled it up, and, and I had, you know what? I think I have it in my pocket. <laughs> Let me see. Might take a minute. Yeah, I do. I had this little, this little bolt. It's very smooth and rounded. Looks like it could be 100 years old. I don't know. But somehow this was right under my hand when I put my hand down. And I just picked it up and I was like, what in the world? And I just kind of put it in my pocket and kept praying. I didn't even think about it. And then I was like, oh, gosh, you know what? I bet that came out of that altar. <laughs> I mean, it probably did. I think you, you, you can inspect it, you guys that know architecture and stuff. But, but this could be one of those, you know, I didn't mean to steal something from Asbury. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry if you're watching. But it was just so curious that I put my hand right down on the altar and this was in my hand. I was like, what in the world? So I brought something back. You know, we got pews from Brownsville, so now maybe we got a bolt from the altar at uh, Asbury. But, you know, I got to thinking about this. You know, what, what is a bolt? It's a fastener. It joins two things together. That's what it's for. It holds things together. So maybe that was a sign or a wonder, or maybe the Lord was showing me that he was going to tie these things together from here to there and a lot of other places. And don't get me wrong. I don't think that God's just going to do something here. But I will tell you, God's going to do something here. I've seen too much. I've heard too much. I know too much about this stuff. There's going to be something here that, that, well, we'll just wait and see. But anyway... I want to read some scripture. I'm just sharing some kind of stories with you, but I want to read some scripture. This entire thing about first love is obviously Revelation 2. And you guys know that in Revelation 2 and 3, he wrote to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Here is a semi-controversial view, but one I actually hold to. Jesus always said things in multiple multiple layers deep because he was prophetic. If you stack the last 2,000 years of church history up against those seven churches, they actually unfold the church age in sequential order from Ephesus to Laodicea. It's an interesting study. I've, I've spent hours looking into this. But Ephesus would have been the first church, and it would have represented that first century beginnings of the church. So it'll make sense when you start reading this. Now, where do you think we are? Seven. Laodicea. Oh, you think you're so rich and you think you're so great. No, I think you're blind, poor, and naked. Repent. That's where we're at. So we've come through seven of these, but we're going back to the beginning, beginning, beginning of the church. 
To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, he says this, I know your deeds. Now look, he's going to commend them highly. I know your labor. I know your perseverance. And that you cannot tolerate evil people. And you've put those who call themselves apostles to the test, and they are not, and you found them to be false. Sounds like they're doing pretty good, doesn't it? And you have perseverance, and you have endured on account of my name, and you have not become weary. He's talking to the first century church, if you think about this in chronological order. You think about, this is the apostles. This is the early beginnings. This is the book of Acts. And he's saying, man, you guys are persevering. You're not putting up with evil. You guys are calling these false guys out. You guys are getting it done. But I have this one thing against you that you have left your first love. Here's my question. How soon after the crucifixion and the resurrection and the birth of the church did their love grow cold? 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. I don't know, but it happened. And it will happen to every one of us if we're not super careful. I don't care if we've been serving Jesus for 50 years. He said, you're doing all this stuff right, but one thing you're doing wrong. You left your first love. How many of you guys remember? Boy, this would be fun. I could give everybody a mic and tell you you had five minutes to tell about your come to Jesus story. And by the time we left out of here, everybody would be so jacked up at listening to everybody's first love story with Jesus. I know mine. Boy, I know when I fell for God. Do you remember yours? And if you haven't had one yet, you can do it today. But there's a time when you first see Him for who He is, and you literally drop everything. How many of you guys have had that encounter with God? Jesus is telling the first church, you're doing all this stuff right, but don't forget that initial just simplicity of me and you. They were doing the work. Man, they were starting the church. You think they had some important work to do? They're birthing the church. They're going into new regions that have never heard the gospel, and they're birthing the church in real time. These guys were not slackers. You're talking about Peter. You're talking about Paul. Go second generation, you're talking about Irenaeus, you're talking about the church fathers, you're talking about all these guys. You think they were slackers? No, man. They would probably put us to shame at how hard they were working in the kingdom of God. But yet still, he said, I've got this against you that you've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen. Man, look at that. They're doing all the work and getting commended for it. But then he says, remember how far you have fallen. Is that a curious thing to hear from Jesus when you're out there busting your tail, promoting the kingdom and the church and building ministry, right? But he tells them to repent and do the deeds you did at first. Do your first works over again or else I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Does that startle anybody? That the first century church that we all look to as the standard got rebuked for losing their first love? Wowzers. They were probably doing a whole lot more than we are. And yet they got that indictment from the Lord Jesus himself. So you guys know this if you've been around here for any length of time. Our number one goal here is the first commandment. Matthew 22, 36. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? It was a loaded question, wasn't it? And Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the foremost commandment. Now you know this is Jesus Christ saying this right here. He just told you that this is the greatest and the foremost commandment Hold up your entire thick Bible and boil it down to that one sentence as far as level of importance. Do you catch the seriousness of that? This is the greatest. Now, I'm going to say this too. I was alluding to this during the worship just now. 
Most of us in this room have seen God do a lot of awesome things. How many of you guys have seen God do miracles? Probably just about everybody. How many of you guys have like seen somebody physically healed? I mean, like right in front of your eyes. How many of you have seen somebody delivered? Like demon was there, it's gone. How many of you guys have seen uh, someone get baptized in the Spirit for the first time? You've seen, you know, all of this stuff. You know me. I am certainly not opposed to any of that, and I'm guilty of all of it. I do all that stuff. But let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of man and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm going to talk to charismatics for a minute because we think we're cool because we got gifts. Can I shoot you straight for a minute? This revival I just went to just broke out on a Methodist campus. Their stick is not speaking in tongues and miracles. Are you hearing me? I'm going to keep going. But I'll tell you one thing they had. They had love. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Do we really believe these verses in all of our charismania? I'm talking to us because I'm one of us. It's all I've ever known is the power of God. From birth, all I've ever known is Pentecostal power. It's all I've ever been around. I've seen all the stuff. But it says if I don't have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions to charity, if I surrender my body that I may glory. He's talking about literally becoming a martyr. But do not have love, it does me no good. Boy, wouldn't that be terrible to be a martyr and have the wrong motive and it do you no good. <laughs> Talk about a bad deal. And if you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. Love does not brag. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It's not provoked doesn't keep an account of a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, keeps every confidence, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You want to win every time? Listen to this. Love never fails. Could it really be this simple, guys? Love Never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they'll be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there's knowledge, it'll be done away with. Now I have to at least throw out this theological point. All your cessationists that think that God doesn't do stuff anymore somehow point to this. It's bogus. I don't have to explain all that to you, do I? It is bogus. God never stopped doing what he does. Maybe I'll tell you more about that at a later date. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Actually, I've got to tell you one more thing about the theology. They say that when the perfect comes is the Bible. So when the Bible was canonized, that's the perfect. So now we don't need the gifts of the Spirit because we have a Bible. That is actually the theology that most people in this region believe that where we live. I'm just being honest. But it's bogus, and I'm just going to tell you. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you it's not true. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I used to think like a child. I used to reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Now here's the kicker. But now faith, hope, and love remain, these three. But the greatest of these is what? So what Paul goes to great lengths to show is you can be the most gifted person on planet earth. You can have all the gifts. You can have all the stuff that we so highly esteem in charismania. And if you don't have love, who gives a flying flip? Heaven sure doesn't. Am I saying something bold? I want to make the point. 
I don't care how anointed, gifted, powerful, whatever we all think we are or whatever we've been around or whatever we've experienced, if we are not walking, first of all, in first love to God and then love for our brothers and sisters, we are a crock. Okay. Listen to this, 1 John 4, 8. The one who does not love does not know God. (laughs) Could you stop right there? Well, I'm gifted. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. You know this. You've heard this. God doesn't have love. He is love. It is the essence of his very nature, character. It's who he is. So how can we represent him even close to accurately if everything we do doesn't come from a place of love? I'm saying something. By this, the love of God was revealed in us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we may live through Him. You want to hear what love is? In this is love, not that we loved God in all of our self-righteousness. Oh, we loved God. No, He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, meaning Jesus took our place. Everybody in this room deserved what He got. And he took it for us, the whipping boy. He took our guilt, our shame, all of us on himself. That is love. Not that we were like, oh, we love God. No, he loved us and we responded to his love. You ready for the the main kicker of the whole thing right here? 1 John 4, 19. We love because and only because he first loved us. And I'm going to share this a little bit later, but do you know that this is how the Asbury thing started? I'll tell you a little bit about it, but they had a 30-minute chapel service. It wasn't anything spectacular, but you, I've watched it two or three times already. The speaker wasn't flashy, but really what he basically said is, you guys have to know the love of God. And you have to experience the love of God. And no matter what career you're going to do when you leave this college, you have to be changed by the love of God. And I'm going to share a little bit more about where it went from there. But those kids in that Asbury revival, all of that started with this. We love because he first loved us. For this reason, listen to Ephesians 3. I bend the knees. This is Paul praying for the Ephesians. Which is interesting because we started out talking about the Ephesian church and the first love thing, right? From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Here's the prayer. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner being. So that Christ, listen to this, may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in what? What's Paul's prayer for Ephesus? that they would be rooted and grounded in love, that they would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Those that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. Do you hear Paul's prayer for the Ephesians? More than anything, I want you to know the love of God. Because you cannot give away what you haven't received. Until you're fully, fully, fully loved, you cannot love. I don't know how people stay married that don't know Jesus. Like, what are they falling back on? What? How? It would be completely impossible. The love of God is everything. Now listen to this one. We all love this verse. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. It's his power that reveals that love in us. To him be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus in all generations forever and ever. You guys still good? I've only got a couple more scriptures and then we're going to pray. One of the kids that got up and gave his testimony at the revival, he probably was 20, 21, super on fire, but they said that a week ago he was kind of a hellion. You know, And now all of a sudden he's like the most fired up kid on campus for Jesus. You see how that, that, that flips? 
He got up and he said, I want to share with you my favorite verse in all of Scripture. And here's what he did. Romans 8, starting in verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it's written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things... We are overwhelmingly we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Listen to this one. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are we rooted? and grounded and established beyond belief in the love of God. If we're not, we have to be. This is the foundation of everything. I'll share one last thing with you. I told you I watched that chapel service multiple times. And I rewound the last 10 seconds of it about 10 times because the guy said one thing and then he walked off the stage and then the camera cuts off. And then it goes for 24 hours a day ever since after. Because they cut the camera off. They thought chapel was over except that the kids wouldn't leave. But here's the prayer. And boy, you want to talk about a simple prayer. But I've watched it. Here's exactly what the, the chapel speaker prayed. Jesus, do a new thing in our midst. Revive us by your love. And all the kids said, Amen. And that started the whole thing. <laughs> Jesus, do a new thing in our midst. Revive us by your love. <laughs> Could it be that simple? Yes, it is that simple. What we need today, right this minute, is a fresh baptism of the love of Jesus. <laughs> Oh, man. I want healing. I want signs. I want wonders. I want all the stuff. No, we need a baptism of love. We need a baptism of love. Because really, at the end of the day, the love of Jesus is the only thing that's going to last to the end, and it's the only thing that's going to actually change the world. It's the only thing that actually works. Because I've known a lot of powerful people that, that needed more love and it was less effective than it should have been. Let's say it that way. Did I say that nice? Amen. We need a fresh baptism of love. So I think Jesus is faithful to do that for us this morning. All it is is coming like a little child and asking. So you guys want to receive... A fresh baptism of his love today. Can we ask him for that? I want to do something unique. You don't have to participate, but it won't be as fun as if you don't. Can we somehow get where everybody is holding a hand of somebody next to them? Like where this whole room is connected in one circuit. Can we do that? I mean, it doesn't have to be a circle, but just to where it's all connected. You know what I'm saying? You guys on the web, uh, just you have to reach your hands out toward us because everybody find a hand. Everybody connect. Somebody be the connector. Hey, somebody needs to connect with this group right here. Somebody make a make a connection here. Yeah, I don't care about the cameras. It doesn't matter. We'll be okay. We're, we're getting there. If, if you got a three-way connection, that's fine too. You can grab somebody's arm. There you go. Is everybody connected to a brother or sister in Christ here? I want, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going I, I want, to. I want you to, to repeat after me. We're going to ask the Lord for this right now. So can we just all, every mouth open, can we do this together? 
Father, would you give my brother and sister a fresh baptism of your love now Jesus name just receive that right there we just release first love over every person right here and every person on this web that our hearts would be so revived by your love that we would be consumed with passion for Jesus like we were in the very beginning. Father, take us back to our first love where nothing else is as interesting and nothing else satisfies and everything else just pales in comparison to the simplicity of just knowing you and just being close to you. And I want you to pray for your brothers and sisters while we're all connected. Pray what you want for yourself. Pray over them. And pray out loud. Pray that God would give them an abundance of His Spirit, of His love, of His grace. Father, pour out Your love on us this morning. Lord, we receive a fresh baptism of your love in this place. Every heart, every life. Oh God, revive us by your love. praying for your brother and sister would you just get your own heart your own body in a a posture just to receive from the Lord just like I was laying on that altar you don't have to be laying on that altar in in Kentucky right now that same love of God right now is going to permeate your life just get in a posture where you just receive More of your love, God.
Did any of you lose sleep when you first loved Jesus? Get ready to lose some sleep again. Did any of you get up extra early just to seek the Lord? What did he tell the Ephesian church? Do your first works over again. Did any of you tell your friends, no, I can't go out tonight because I'm just going to sit here with Jesus? This is first love stuff. And it doesn't make any logical sense because love doesn't. It's just about being with him. God's calling us in deeper. Lord, we hear your call this morning to just get back to the basics, to just get back to love, to just get back to pure worship. Many of us have been distracted for so long that we don't even hardly remember. Even doing good things. But God, would you take us back to our first love? Where we literally cannot wait to just be with you. where you're the thing that we desire most in this life. More than anything else. Father, we ask you to make us your habitation. make a place for you for your glory to dwell so father would you build us together into that house of the lord into your dwelling and would you so fill us with your glory and your fire and your love that the whole world comes to experience it Let the fire of your love so fill our hearts that it spreads to the ends of the earth. In 